Uh, thanks very much, Tina. Um, Honoured to be here this evening, and thank you all for, for coming along uh, to listen into this chat. Um, I haven't been to Christchurch now since 2016, um, and this trip is the first time I've been to New Zealand without either my bike or my skis. And it wasn't so bad in Wellington, but I tell you what, flying into Christchurch today, the plane flew in over Port Hills and then banked, and, uh, and then Mount Hutt was out to the left. And um, yeah, it was pretty hard to handle, actually. <laughs> Good admit, it's lovely to be here, but I'd love my bike and skis with me. Um, just a quick shout out before I start as well, just a thanks to um, Daniel Crooks um, from Architectus. He took me on a stroll uh, this afternoon around town. We checked out the Greenway. That's what an incredible asset that is. So much potential um, through time with the kind of car dealerships adjacent. It kind of feels like there's plenty of growth there for, for that particular intervention. And, um, and, and down, uh, down towards the stadium, just seeing that mixed-use precinct and the new housing and wrapping back past the Shigiruban um, Cathedral and back along, back along the river. The public realm works have, have um, really come such a long way since 2016, the last time I was here. It's feeling, feeling really great. So tonight's talk, a good old yarn, kind of um, spoke last night a little bit about the opportunity I had um, yesterday to attend um, the Atfield studio uh, up there on the hill. And it was really important, I guess, it provided me with a lot of context as to, as to who this, this guy Af was, the myth. Um, kind of gave me a lot of comfort <laughs> around a connection point. I, I'd done some reading um, before coming over here and sort of this myth, this legend, and the idea of, of, of a guy, the irreverence um, and the passion um, that, that he obviously had. Uh, but seeing that project yesterday just, just reminded me of, of the potential of architecture and the potential of architecture to, to um, just show us um, who, who we are as humans and, and, and what's possible and what's, what's good in the world. I really had that sense walking through the project yesterday, the labyrinth of space and the way that the, the project had been used to experiment through time, um, challenge notions of design and um, challenge the practice to improve. And this little detail here to the left with the stairs um, kind of disappearing over the, the ridge um, was a little slide for the kids. And Zach Athfield, our son, had taken me through and having a really great chat about what that detail meant to Zach. And I think the potential of architecture and, and, and the reminder that, that uh, yep, the practice of architecture, the practice of building does need to be a serious endeavor. We spend a lot of money on, on buildings and, and, and they're around for a really long time. But this notion that, that, that you know, we, we should challenge ourselves to not, not take the process too seriously and, and be open to um, the potential of great architecture um, and the notion of, of touching and feeling and playing with buildings and, and, and that, um, the return uh, that, that we receive and the joy that comes from great architecture. It was great. It was great to see this building yesterday. It's one of the best buildings I've ever seen. A Cold Hard Truth is the title for tonight's talk. So this has a, a dual meaning for me. So in the context of the ch climate challenge and the urgency with which we need to address the challenges, tomorrow is too late. There's a, a real urgency for us to be addressing um, challenges of climate, particularly within the built environment, which is such a great uh, and large contributor um, to broader impacts. It also captures this, this notion that's really um, inherent to our practice. Um, one of my greatest fears is the fear of regret um, the idea of getting to a point and, uh, later in, in life and, and having a sense that I didn't give it my all or I didn't, I didn't push, I didn't do what I could as a person to challenge um, or, or to contribute to the solution uh, to, to the challenge that we face uh, in this time, in this age. And this quote captures it for me, the, the idea that, that, that uh, in one way or another we'll suffer from two pains, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. It's really motivating. It ties back to this, uh, this tipping point 
Um, I've been banging on about uh, the impacts of climate change and the need for action for a really, really long time. And back in 2019, the kids got out on the streets and uh, demanded better. I think uh, for us in our practice, it was absolutely a tipping point. We'd been around for four or five years and from this point onward, we noticed a really big kind of snowball effect. And the kids getting out on the street demanding more, demanding more from, from decision makers and, and politicians and, and practitioners and, and professionals, um, I think really cut home. And importantly, I think it challenged, uh, you know, I, th I think it struck a chord with the grandparents of the world, really, uh, the current uh, decision makers and key holders to the city. Um, this idea that their grandchildren were out on the street um, really demanding that, that we find a solution to one of the greatest challenges facing uh, the globe and humanity. You just saw the passion on their faces. We had 100,000 kids out on the street in Melbourne, I'm sure, here in Christchurch, similarly. You had a few kids out demanding, demanding more. So I'm going to wind back a little bit now. 2002, hit the height, what's in a name? It's one of the greatest things about university. You have the opportunity to, to think, question, um, you're exposed to new ideas, um, and, and it's a really formative time. So for me, uh, back at architectural theory class at, at the University of Melbourne, I uh, came across a, a concept called the unity of opposites, this, this notion that um, um, every action has a reaction. Um, and it, it, it really um, influenced me quite heavily as a reading. At the same time, I was also into 80s and 90s hip hop. And the, the lyrics to, to this particular song by Public Enemy are an absolute classic. If you haven't taken the time, I'm sure everyone knows the actual song, but if you haven't taken the time to read the lyrics, these guys were ahead of their time, living in Los Angeles during a really challenging period um, uh, through that late 80s, early 90s, and, uh, and the Black Whites movement, and just, just the, the way they captured the hypocrisy in the media um, led me to develop the name Hip Bear Society. At that point, it was time to find an outlet um, for the energy that I had. It's kind of this rebel architectural student running around with a, with a paste-up sticker, hip hype, had a name, had a bunch of ideas, um, pasting up stickers around town in good company here. I took this sticker about four years ago, so it's still, still there. Absolute rebel without a cause. Um, and into the first three years of, of university, for me, um, started to kind of pick up on um, this really important idea, you know, this notion of theory versus practice. Um, I read The Fountainhead way too early and, and got caught up in the whole idea of Howard Rourke and um, uh, around year three in practice, um, a friend was working for Six Degrees Architects in Melbourne and one of the directors, Mark Healy, was building his house and, and Mark couldn't get labourers uh, and so I stuck my hand up and and um, we, we had a year out uh, in, in Melbourne as part of Melbourne University. So you do the first three years and then you do a year out in a, in a practice and you are meant to pick up office skills. Um, did a deal with Mark and he agreed to sign off on my architectural uh, office practice if, if, I, if I worked on his, his job as a, as a labourer. So I spent the year working on Mark's house um, and uh, probably one of the best things I did, I guess. What I took from that experience was th this notion of just how much skill and talent existed with uh, the guys on site. So at Smoko, each day, um, you know, you'd have painters, plasterers, electricians, um, brickies. They knew I was an architectural student, so they'd bail me up and tell me how I needed to do things and how drawings needed to be done to make their life easier. So I got, I got I got read, read that act, but at the same time realised that these guys had so much skill and attention to detail, and particularly trades working on high-end architectural projects, and just how much there was to gain by, by op being open to that, that relationship and seeking to facilitate that relationship through deeper collaboration. Um, so I, I ended up um, building a really great relationship with that builder. I spent the next four years going through university working, um, working for the builder a couple of days on site through that period. This house, um, uh, under the, the practice um, text there, is a house by Cassandra Fay in Blackrock. So I spent two years on that house um, working 
across all of the detail, um, sanding back the most minute uh, pieces of aluminium tile angle you can imagine. Um, learned a lot through that period. Um, for me, I, I took the opportunity uh, also at that time to, to head away um, to Denmark um, for 12 months. Uh, and luckily, through that period, I, I met probably the most influential person um, that, that's existed, that's, that's had that influence over my career, Jan Gale. So this notion of, of people and buildings, um, Jan had been, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure almost everyone in the room does, but for those of you who don't know, Jan um, existed around the, the modernist era of architecture. Um, and was really perplexed by this, this notion of um, for kind of formism and the idea that, that architects were building buildings and not thinking about people. Jan's wife uh, was a, a psychiatrist and she played a, a really big role in, in, um, in, in, in um, sort of opening up that dialogue with him. She introduced him to a book um, called The Hidden Dimension by Edward T. Hall, which is all about space and um, the relationships uh, between humans and spatial impacts on, on, on what makes us comfortable and it expands into sort of um, ideas of population density and stress and it's a really formative book, really, really worth reading if you haven't, if you haven't looked into it. And Jan, kind of one of his, his most famous books is a book called Life Between Buildings. Um, so if you haven't come across that, I highly recommend it. So it's this notion that, that the space in between buildings, the ground plane, the, the space at which buildings hit the ground is is where we should be spending our time, energy, and effort in, in designing buildings. Another formative part of my career and has led me to, to, to what we've been doing over the last 10 years is my side gig through university, which was a semi-professional career in skiing. Um, two, two elements to this, I think, uh, when I wasn't studying, I was always away somewhere, so either Europe or North America, um, chasing the snow and, 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 and sort of throwing myself off things that I definitely don't throw myself off anymore. Um, but that exposure to that European context, I guess, through that formative phase, um, just seeing the quality of doors and windows and, and buildings and this idea that, you know, you could actually be warm within a building. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, was, was, was a new thing. Um, to, to a kid from Melbourne, the number of times I've had people say to me um, that either come from you know, North America or Central Europe, I've never been as cold um, as I've ever been in a building in Melbourne in winter. Um, and buildings look a little bit better here in Christchurch, but I tell you what, in Wellington yesterday, the number of buildings I saw with single glazing and kind of um, t timber, slat, uh, timber slats on the facade, I reckon it's going to be pretty cold in those buildings as well. So th again, the experience. Um, you know, I'd had the theory at university, but not the experience. You go away to Europe, you'd have the experience. It really sits with you. It's powerful. Um, the other one's risk. So, and progression. Um, so in skiing, you know, when, you, when you're at the top of a big line, you take yourself out out of bounds, or you're you're jumping off a really big jump. You're making a decision, um, and you're backing yourself. When you're halfway down a big line. You're not sitting down and waiting for a helicopter to come and pick you up. You're getting yourself out. And that's a really good analogy and has informed me in the context of the risks that we take in business, this idea that when you make a decision, um, you're all in and you back yourself to make it work and, and come out the other end. Good old Brunswick in Melbourne. So all of this formative phase kind of culminated in me going and buying a a block of land in Brunswick and designing two townhouses and deciding that whilst I was working full time I'd go and build them. Um, uh, I demolished the site, put the site fence up, came back the next day and uh, 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 had, had this message from, um, from the locals in Brunswick. Brunswick's great, right? Like if you get a little bit too far ahead of yourself, you'll be reminded of where you are and, and, and what your responsibility is. I love this image, it's one of my favourite images. Um, I reckon a fair few developers do, and if we crossed out Brunswick and put any other city in the world, I reckon it'd be pretty relevant. Um, but I'd like to think that, that we're not. I'd like to think that we're trying to create something. This is North Street. It was a little two townhouse development, three bedrooms at the front, two at the back. Um, 
gave us an opportunity to test a whole lot of ideas, a roof yard on top. Um, one of the key ideas for this project is how a building relates to the street and how if a building is a little bit more open to the street, um, we, we can, we can um, drive um, better interactions with community and, and, and opening ourselves up. We have a lot of terrace houses in, in Melbourne and um, the front room in a terrace house is typically a bedroom and the living room's at the rear. So you walk around the streets and it's you know, after a certain period of, of, you know, after it gets dark, it's really quite um, eerie. And so this was a test in layering. So layering with a fence that when you're perpendicular, you can see through the slats. When you're not perpendicular, you can't. Um, the tea tree that sits behind grows out. Uh, and then there's some film on the glazing. So when you're sitting down internally, um, you have privacy. When you're standing up, you have connection to street. I lived in this, in this townhouse for two years and um, you know, formed some really great relationships from people who kind of stuck their head over the front fence and said, g'day, and here's a picture of Wes on the bike and me with a beer in my hand and the fire pit behind, G giving you a really good, good um, understanding of how that space worked. Um, this is a shot. Highlights another important idea, I guess, for us. We, we have a lot of regulatory constraints over a process that say you must do certain things, and car parking is a big one. It's been a big theme for us in our practice. The future of cities is, is, is fundamentally less um, car ownership, less private car transport. Um, and yet, we're still forced to, to provide car parks, so about 25 square metres of space in Melbourne that, that can cost you to purchase that any, anywhere between 12 and $15,000 a square metre. So it's the better part of $250,000 plus worth of space that costs you to buy that uh, the authorities tell you you have to put a car in. We've played around with this idea a lot with our projects. In this particular project, um, what we've done is clad the, the carport with plywood. Um, the rear roller door at the, at the back can easily be taken out and a glass door slotted in. Um, we burnished the slab. There's no level change between the living area and the car park, and we burnished the, the, the slab from living area into the car park. Um, really, it was our first, uh, I guess, um, attempt to kind of work around those regulations. I guess through my career, it's pretty much I'm defined by becoming an expert at getting around things. Um, but it's objectives focused, right? Like, there's, there's absolutely no reason why that shouldn't have 10 bikes in that garage. And um, when, I, when I open the door uh, at the front, um, it's just really great to be able to work on your bike. And again, say good day to neighbours, bring, bring community in. Um, but have control. When, when you want privacy, you can have privacy. When you want to open up, you can. Um, another important point, I've included this one. Domain's the largest real estate publication in Victoria. It's the most read sales publication. It's a big focus for us. It's nice when you get recognition from the design community. Um, but our mission's broader, so our mission is to get better design and the benefits of sustainability in front of as many people as we possibly can. This is the first time that Domain had put a person uh, on the front cover of this publication. And that was really nice for us, because kind of tying back to notions from Jan Gale and buildings and people and this idea of you know, the, the very reason we're building buildings, you know, to have that as one of our first major pieces of recognition and to have, you know, to be the first person on the cover of the publication was something for a tiny little townhouse in Brunswick. And just some snaps from in, inside. Um, and this is my partner, Katia, partner in business, partner in life. So she'll feature in a few of the photos. I'm going to throw some values at you tonight, just through the slides, to talk to some of the ideas that are inherent to our practice, how we think about things. Um, this Steve Jobs quote, some of you all know it, it's more fun being a pirate than joining the Navy. Um, it's not that we're pirates and, and we want to steal things and steal your money and you know, we want to be that kind of developer. It's more, more talks to this notion of um, what it takes to maintain um, creativity and vibrancy as a business goes through time. So um, this photo is an image of how we celebrate topping out on our buildings. That's the HVH Jolly Roger. Put a flagpole up, we hoist the Jolly Roger, and it's a really good reminder of what keeps us honest and real to who we are and what, what we're seeking to achieve. Um, 
putting a tree up on top of the roof is a little bit too much of a cliche for us. So phase one for our business, when we really got going, um, end of 2015, 2016, uh, I'd been working for private developers um, for, for a number of years. Um, I'd made the call, instead of following a career in architecture, um, I, I was going to get out and, and figure out what the um, what, what made the dark side tick, right? So I spent seven or eight years working for, for a couple of different private developers um, in Melbourne, learning the dark art of feasibility, learning um, as much as I could uh, about the enabling force that sits behind project procurement, project establishment, finance, legals, accounting, all of that boring stuff. Um, and I was out on my bike one afternoon in Brunswick, uh, riding along, uh, along down. I, I went down to check out the commons that had just recently been finished. So Breathe Architecture and, and um, Small Giants had developed that project. And I bumped into Jeremy McLeod in the street. And Jeremy um, you know, was all excited. He'd, um, he'd just put a, a $50,000 non-refundable deposit down on the warehouse across the road. And he'd done that because the commons had just been finished and he had a database of 70 odd people who had come to him saying, I, we, want, we want to live in a building like the commons. We want better, we want more sustainable apartments. We want you know, timber in our apartments, God forbid. Um, and he's like, shit, I don't, I don't, I don't have a feasibility. Um, and you know, we've been, we've been friends for a little while and sort of he knew our capability. And, you know, that was a real moment in time for me. I had to, I had to step out of um, having an equity stake in a development project that I'd been working on and, and step out and set Hip versus Hype up properly and in doing so help the Nightingale crew establish the idea which has now become so um, famous. Um, so yeah, for me it was just that perfect coming together of, of everything that I'd learned through my formative phase and combining that with the learnings in the dark arts and then being able to use those tools to enable um, uh, the creation of the Nightingale model project. Um, so Nightingale 1, we set up the shareholder structure, we raised the equity, 27 architects came in, funded um, uh, the initial equity piece of the project, um, set up all of the contracts with all the various consultants, ran, I ran the process up till financial close, uh, which is having a builder on board, contracts signed, pre-sales contracts in place with purchases, and Breathe took over um, the delivery of the project. And the rest is history, really, but it kind of talks to, I don't know, for anyone young in the room, it talks to the potential of, of staying true to your values and searching out those opportunities um, for you to bring your vision together. And when that opportunity presents, you might not necessarily be ready for it, but you know, you jump, you back yourself. It's like dropping into that big line. You make the call to drop and you get yourself to the bottom. So we set up Hip versus Hype at that time. This is our first studio space in North Carlton, Melbourne Little Shop Front. I'd seen this space as a student. Uh, it was on a bike path opposite a cafe um, in, in the inner north of Melbourne. Really great space, really great light. I'd always kind of said that'd be a great place to have an office. And at this time I was riding past and saw the agent put the for lease sign up again, another one of those moments where you're not ready to take out a lease on a property. Uh, but you do, because you had this idea in your head that it'd be a great office, um, so you did it. Um, and then you had to figure out the problem of, of um, yeah, now you've got a lease and you've got to pay, you've got to fit it out and you've got to pay the rent. Um, you know, we had a lot of fun with this space. Those timber windows there are prototype windows by a company called Bink that have worked across all of our projects. They make a really great product. They've got a really good story. Um, so a couple of brothers, they um, use CNC technology to work with Australian native timbers and they bring the hardware in um, from Europe, so Germany and Italy, um, for these really great lift and slide, tilt and turn window arrangements. So again, it's that those windows I saw in Europe uh, in, in those chalets uh, that I'd stayed in that were warm, um, we had an opportunity to start to prototype with these manufacturers. Um, so the window on the right is one of their first systems. The window on the left is the system that we work together on to seek to bring the cost of that, of that system down to a cost that would enable us to start to include them in our apartment projects. Um, the artwork on the right, um, we, we engaged Adnate, who'd been a mate, 
for a couple of years. There's a few Adnate pieces up around town, actually. He came over post-earthquake and, and um, with crew, street art crew. Um, so I saw one of his pieces up um, this afternoon. It's a nice, nice connection point. Um, but really about our business's commitment to First Nations and what that means in the context of you know, our responsibility as built environment professionals working on land and, and the responsibility we have to take um, that connection seriously and that, that chain of knowledge seriously and seek to have that influence how we think about building more sustainably and in a more integrated way. This is our team, um, Pride Centre in St Kilda, um, great community asset um, funded by state government. Um, I've taken a while to get here, but I'm going to spin you through who we are and what we do quickly before I continue. Um, it's reasonably complicated, so bear with me. But as a business, we undertake our own development projects here at Bursa Sype, and we do that to um, generate an evidence base that better design and more sustainably built buildings um, are not only commercially viable, but there's strong market demand for them. Um, so you can, you can bank the project, you can make money from the project, uh, and that people want to buy those apartments as a market for it. We do that to send a message to the broader development industry that, that they should be doing better and that you know, a, a minimum um, based approach uh, to development is, is not the future. And we've been really successful at that with all of the projects that I'll show you tonight um, alongside the Nightingale, the Nightingale effect that, that is just, just rippling out across uh, Australia at the moment. So alongside that, we have our sustainability consultancy, which is really unique, I guess, to have a development company and a sustainability consultancy under the, under the one roof. We do that because for us to deliver best practice sustainability ourselves, we need those skills really close to the business. So we need to be able to do in-depth analysis um, and iterative analysis through projects um, that we could never afford to pay a third party consultant to do. Um, so we've built two component parts to that advisory business. We've got the Better Cities and Regions team and we've got the Better Buildings team. Our Better Cities and Regions team is all about strategy and policy. So that's our 10, 20 and 30 year Trojan horse. So we work with local governments and state governments all around Australia and into the, into the Asia Pacific um, region. Uh, we work on sustainability strategies and policies and we work, we work on setting up a framework that can enable better. And a really good example of that is a piece of work we did with the city of Melbourne. There's a big urban re re regeneration project called Arden Macaulay in Melbourne, which is, which is adjacent to the North Melbourne Metro Station that's being finished at the moment next to the education precinct. And we were successful in having a, a zero carbon um, commitment written into that policy and 100% electrification policy uh, um, requirement written into that policy. That's, that's Victoria's second largest urban regen project. And um, so for me, that's one of our biggest wins um, in, in, in that part of the business. Another thing that we've also recently worked on, we, we created a green factor tool for the city of Melbourne and the city of Brisbane. Um, so that's essentially a tool uh, that enables any development application, the landscape on any development application to be assessed against a benchmark. Um, the benchmark is created, it's a context specific benchmark, research has to be undertaken. Um, but what it does is create a score for any given development application and talk to that application, the landscape responses, uh, response of that application's um, response to indigenous native vegetation, but also indigenous and native ve uh, vegetation that's water sensitive and encourages the kind of um, uh, fauna that we need to see in our cities um, that, that too many of our buildings are successfully turning away from our urban environments. So it's about addressing heat, heat island impacts and it's also about um, bringing um, the greenery that we need to see in our cities to see more sustainable cities into the future. So that's that part of the business. The Better Buildings team, um, they're engineers. So they get into the nuts and bolts of buildings. We have one of four Passive House certifiers in Australia. Um, we do all of the relevant certification pathways, Green Star, um, Living Building Challenge, Neighbours and Nathurs, all the rest of it. Um, but we're also really focused on this idea of design optimization. For us, the future of sustainability is an intersection between ESD and, and the services consultant and the architect. 
um, you know, to set up um, uh, design optimized buildings, buildings that use uh, less energy, buildings that are more comfortable and, and, and more healthy. Um, we also run some work share spaces, uh, which is essentially our, our homes around town, one in Brunswick, one in South Melbourne, but it also gives us an opportunity as a business to, to give a leg up to some of those startup companies that exist in our ecosystem. We can give them a little bit of space, help them along, um, and, and also connect in and, and we share and, 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 and bounce off each other. Here's another one of our, our values. Um, far too much talk, and nowhere near enough follow through in this space, far too much greenwashing. Um, it's just the antithesis of our approach. Um, we, we have to just, just get away from this, this idea of um, talk's going to solve the, the solutions. Um, um, and, and it's one of our core values, reminds us that just not to believe our own bullshit, um, basically, which just far too many people do. Phase two for us, 2018 to 2020, we're into our creep phase as a business. We had two projects um, going through this phase. We had the Model S and we had the Model 3. Uh, Rusk and Elwood, the Model 3, was all about a high value townhouse product that would enable us to develop the systems and technologies and approaches to low energy building. Um, um, we installed batteries, solar, energy recovery, ventilation systems, high performance facades, and we were selling four townhouses at three and a half million dollars each. We had the budget to push. And at the same time, we were running a co-design project, three townhouses in Brunswick, much lower price point, um, but we were seeking to um, take what we'd learned out of the Model S experiment and feed it in to the Davison Collaborative or the Model 3, the model that we could sell out more affordably. And we're inspired by that thinking coming out of Tesla at the time. A little bit less of the thinking coming out of Tesla these days, but um, at the time it was really influential. So this is Ruskin Elwood. It's a four townhouse project, um, three level townhouses uh, fronting a canal. So we took two original terrace houses, one that had a blank frontage to the canal, uh, and we reorientated the entire project. So from two blocks running east-west to four blocks running north-south. And we played with these ideas again of, of how the building opens up um, to the public realm and how um, privacy can be managed and, and the public, public realm can layer into the private realm. This project was designed in collaboration with Fieldwork Architects, really great young Melbourne practice. Um, with a real focus on natural materiality, um, the kind of materials that age gracefully, the kind of materials that will enable a building to look better in 10 years um, than, than the day in which the building was finished. Um, so we're about to reshoot this project and the Davison Collaborative that I'll show you in a sec. We're shooting it in spring of this year. Um, this building is entirely engulfed by green now. Um, the bricks are really settling in, they're staining up, the timbers grayed off. Um, the bluestone pavers have settled and the building's just developing character. I think um, for us it's a focus, how do we build buildings that, um, new buildings that can settle into place as quickly as possible um, to make them feel part of um, their location. This is the view from one of the, the townhouses out over the canal. Um, this is right after the photo shoot. Katya and I were sitting here on the balcony wishing we, we could afford to keep one of these townhouses because they were amazing. Um, it's kind of perverse when you're the developer and you can't afford to uh, keep one of them. But anyway, see la vie when you're pushing boundaries. This is another example. We, we got another cover of Domain. We've had two covers to date. Um, again, just can't hammer home the importance of, of seeking to, to, you know, the, the, the value of that exposure outside of the silo of design and architecture and what that means in terms of changing hearts and minds. It's been a really big focus. That's Matilda. Our little, uh, our little Kelpie sitting on the balcony too. She's, she's getting pretty famous by this point. And this is the Davison Collaborative. So this is another iterative process. At the time, so we're in 2018, lots of talk of bow grouping, lots of talk of co-design, lots of talk of how that can, can, can help to be a solution for some of the affordability issues facing people that are just getting worse. Um, the whole idea behind this project was to set up a legal structure that would enable three couples or multiple couples to come together to create a home, remove the developer, internalise the development margin, and by virtue of doing that, reduce the price of the end product. 
Um, like everything, we, we bite off way more than we can chew with the Archer guys um, who, who are the architects on this project. Um, we decided to build the building out of SIPs, um, uh, which is really great for thermal performance, but when you have to insert, insert steel lintels to meet, again, the planning requirement for car park, steel and SIPs just do not play well together. We built this project ourselves, again, um, big part of our process, big windows, um, so continuation of relationships. The front yard that you can see here, um, the, the front townhouse in a multi-unit development is always worth more by virtue of it having street frontage and a, and a front yard, a little bit of extra space but also presence. Um, what we did in order to equalise that but also create a shared asset was carve that space out um, as a shared asset um, to, to be accessed by anybody who lives in the project over time. And it was the most amazing thing for this project. So the front fence is, you know, seat height and seat depth. Um, our, our little kids played on it. Um, we could have croissants on a Sunday morning, beers on a Friday afternoon. It was a really great congregator um, for the project and a really great example of the potential of shared space within these sorts of projects. This is the existing dwelling, and it was a post-war migrant um, family dwelling. So it had done its job. It had raised an Italian family for the past 50 years. At auction, the kids were in, inside. The parents had passed, or the mother had passed away. And the kids were inside. And, and um, you know, after we were successful at auction, we, I remember us, us kind of working through, we, we actually sat down with one of the sons and told him what our plans were for the site. And, you know, it had a little tear in his eye. It was just, you know, I, I think he was really happy that the family home was was being passed down um, uh, and, and, and wouldn't just be kind of developed um, and that, that this idea of three 50-year homes being created on the site. Interestingly, each of the three homes that were built, uh, that we built on the site are, have exactly the same area as um, the existing uh, dwelling on the site. So for us, it's a really good, great example of how we can densify responsibly to level um, uh, high, high performing homes um, using significantly less energy um, and making a really great contribution to place. Another idea is the laneway here on, on the side of the image. Um, so as part of our application, we step the building back a metre to provide a pedestrian access um, in, into each of the developments. So we're actually giving back a metre by 30 metres to public realm. Um, and we're able to meet all of the relevant um, planning targets in doing so. So that kind of led us to, to have a think about what a model like this might look like across the city. Um, yeah, walking down Greenway today, kind of my head was going all over the place thinking about the possibilities. Um, but uh, along the one laneway uh, that this project existed on, there were nine single dwellings. So nine by three equals 27. We zoomed out, we drew a... a, a, a um, one kilometre circle with the Davison Collaborative in the middle and counted up 182 blocks with the similar um, attributes to, to our block, um, times by three, 546. Melbourne is full of laneways. Um, and this idea that, that a model like this, if we could, if we could establish an as-of-right planning pathway, which was our biggest barrier for this project, um, uh, the, 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 the usual pushback um, from, from the authorities for anything different, despite it ticking all of their boxes. Um, uh, what, what could that do for the shape of our city? What could that do for regenerating the laneways around the city? What could that do for the safety of these spaces? Um, and, and again, delivering like a, a relatively low impact form, two level townhouses, great quality facades. Um, one of, one of, unfortunately, the city's uh, object, objections to the project was that the, the project didn't meet neighbourhood character requirements. Um, the street had quite a few weatherboard houses in it, um, despite all of the buildings to the left of screen being built out of brick and brick and Brunswick also being the home of brick manufacturing in, in Melbourne for its entire history. Um, for some reason, this project didn't meet the neighbourhood character requirements um, of its location, which is still perplexing. 
Um, just a little shot from inside. That light fitting is an Archer light fitting, beautiful product. Um, believe it or not, the guys make more out of selling their light. It's a high line light than they do out of architecture. Um, just another reminder for young practices out there to think laterally and use your design skills to create space to enable you to, to push in different directions with your architectural practice. Um, and upstairs, again, these tilt and turn windows, bink, and the quality of space that, that bringing timber into these projects provides. Another one of our values, creation versus extraction. We would argue that far too many developers extract um, value from our communities from place and leave you know, some pretty ordinary outcomes. We're, we're sort of motivated by this idea of creation. So how do we create value? It's our responsibility. We're, we're actors within the built environment. It's our responsibility to, to create value and to leave something that, that leaves place in a better condition than we found it. Um, it's, it's another one of those touch points. You know, when you get a little bit too far ahead of yourself, you, you, get, you get the reminder spray painted on a, on a mattress. For us, our values you know, are, are, are that reminder, keeping ourselves honest. So through phase two as well, we had two sites, the two narrow sites, so Nightingale 2 with six degrees architects and Faraz and York with six degrees architects. With these projects, we unlock the potential of narrow sites. Both of these sites are 12 metres wide. Um, Nightingale 2 is 40 metres long. Faraz in York is 60 metres long. Um, Nightingale 2 is 20 apartments, three ground floor retail spaces. Faraz in York is 22 apartments um, with a single ground floor retail space. Are these narrow sites adjacent to public uh, transport infrastructure? In this instance, hard rail. This is Nightingale 2. We built this building immediately on the railway platform. Uh, we learnt pretty quickly that, um, that that was a risky endeavour. The public liability insurance for this project was $250 million. It's absolutely the hardest project I've ever delivered, but uh, gave us a really great experience as a business of weaving our way through the, the bureaucratic minefield of of all the different government agencies that, that um, had a responsibility to protect the operations of the public transport network. It was a nightmare. Metro, who, are the, who, who hold the operational lease over the network, were renegotiating our lease right at the time that we wanted to commence construction. It was made it even more difficult. But the coolest thing about these narrow sites is you get single loaded apartments. And so natural light and ventilation to both sides of the apartment um, which is really great for energy performance. We can get really, really great um, benefits from passive design principles. Uh, and we can also get um, the benefits of open walkways, connection to street, connection both externally and internally. So this idea that residents are you know, connecting within the building, typical apartment buildings, we're driving into basements, uh, walking into corridors with no natural light, heads down, not meeting people within our buildings. There's no community being developed in, that, in those spaces versus uh, buildings like Nightingale. Nice and open, great visual connection. Um, great visual connection between. Here's a, here's a view from up on one of the walkways. Um, and bringing again these natural timber elements into these buildings. We don't want to lock in unnecessary maintenance cost burdens for, for residents, so we want to be using our natural materials where they're really easy to get to, really easy to maintain, um, and also somewhat protected from weather, so really selective of where, where we end up putting our natural materials. But it's a really big part of these commercial scale buildings feeling like homes, so the texture and materiality um, being a really, really big focus um, and landscape. Another unintended benefit, and you always find these things when you're halfway through building a project, um, the public realm benefit. So being adjacent to public transport infrastructure and having the separation between buildings, all of the apartments um, benefited from um, views out over the, the adjacent um, landscape and trees. Uh, and at the same time, the public realm benefited from the passive surveillance and activation of the assets, so the station became safer, um, and the residents were, were able to, to, to share um, views out over that public infrastructure. This is for us in York, again, the resident, the resident shot at completion about a year ago. Um, 
that's Katya and I down there in the middle, our, our two sons, Massimo and Elio and Matilda again in the shot. Um, so Nightingale 2 works so well as a typology, we shot out around town trying to find a site with similar attributes, narrow, long, um, single loaded apartments. For this project, um, we wanted to push a little bit harder for diversity of mix. Um, Nightingale 2 had just been two and one bedroom apartments split down the middle. Um, in this project, we did 10 three bedroom apartments. Uh, we've got eight two level terrace style apartments about, at about 125 square meters each. Interestingly, pretty much exactly the same size as the Davison Street um, collaborative townhouses. So thinking about how we could create product that, that um, homes, apartments that was much, much more um, you know, attuned to family living, I guess. Um, we had six two bed and six one bed uh, in this project as well. So one of the key moves and differences between the two projects is um, uh, we flipped. Uh, on, on Nightingale 2, um, we really wanted to get natural light into the stairwell um, to encourage people to take the stairs instead of the lift. And we were locked out of that outcome um, due to fire um, considerations and glazing on boundary. So on this project, um, we really moved to flip that arrangement. So the lift sits behind the glazed stairwell in the front of the image. Um, and in this instance, we've been able to get that natural light into the stairwell. The idea being that if you create a great space um, uh, for people to use, they'll use it more often. Um, more people using the stairs more often means more casual interactions. More casual interactions means better relationships between people in the building. Better relationships between people in the building means more resilient community over time. It's using design as a tool um, to help create uh, better actors in the buildings that we're that we're producing. Um, here's the context for you on light rail. Um, we're suckers for punishment. Uh, so many benefits from building on these sites, but very, very challenging. Um, light rail, nowhere near as complicated as, as heavy rail, fortunately. Um, and a view from the opposite side, um, showing the eastern facade, giving you a good idea. All of our glazing on east and west has external blinds, so really limiting um, heat gain in the morning and afternoon and, and, and seeking to benefit as much as possible from passive design principles in our projects. So I'll go into this project in more detail than I have the others um, to, to give you a sense of, of, of what we've achieved. Quality amenity, again, this is Katia and Massimo up on the roof yard, shared space, accessible to all. Um, the building's located immediately adjacent to South Melbourne Market, um, a great fresh food market in South Melbourne in Melbourne. Passive design principles I've talked to. Um, one idea as to how we achieve better quality within these buildings is six degrees, uh, an example of that is six degrees around the initial concept for the scheme. Um, uh, and did the window layout, they worked with our team to, 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 to run some energy and daylight analysis. And then we sent that, that window package off to the window supplier Bink and said, how do we optimize this window design? Um, Bing came back and in this instance basically said, make, make these windows 100 mil shorter and we can reduce the cost by 30%. Um, so we ran that past six degrees, they were okay, our daylight models checked out, our energy models checked out, and, we, and we, we, it, that, that's a way in which our process works to enable to include uh, us to include better quality products within the budget that we have available. It's a, it's a really in-depth, detailed, optimised approach. Um, this building's carbon neutral. So one part of carbon neutrality is seeking to reduce um, embodied carbon by virtue of specifying local materials where possible. Um, the other one's 100% electric. So we're in Victoria. We've got uh, black, black coal, really dirty power. Um, so the biggest thing we can be doing is 100% electric and facilitating the building buying 100% renewable energy. And we do that through an embedded network. An embedded network is a company that <laughs> was originally set up by developers to bulk purchase power at a cheap rate and then sell it back individually to lot owners within a development at a higher rate and kind of clip the ticket through time. Um, we flipped that on its head and utilized that structure in order for us to bulk purchase green power at a cheaper rate than people could access green power at individually and sign up a contract that would enable us to um, to, to commit the building to carbon neutrality um, through a period of time. 
the state government at the previous election uh, banned embedded networks and uh, it was a disaster for this model and our business got on the front foot, um, sort of knocked on state gov's door, used this project and all of the work we'd done with Nightingale as a case study as to why they should carve out an exemption for embedded networks if they were being used responsibly. Um, our policy team came in, we did a, a great piece of work and to state government's credit, um, we, we were able to achieve a carve-out for embedded networks um, that committed to purchasing 100% green power renewable energy and having at least 5% generation on site. So again, really great example of how you can influence policy and influence change at scale um, by virtue of making the argument in the right way. And also the power of an evidence base, right? Had we have not had Nightingale in this building and we were going in theoretically saying, hey, Miss, Mr. Government, we should be doing this, I, I don't know if we, we would have been as successful as we were when we could, we could point to a tangible outcome. And for us, that's, that's why we exist. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why we're taking risks and, and, um, and definitely shortening <laughs> our lifespan um, in, in pushing these projects forward. So embodied carbon, we ran a detailed life cycle analysis on the project internally, third party certified by eTool, um, 3,740 tonnes of CO2. The only meaningful um, way that we're going to reduce that is stop using concrete and start using timber, which we're really focused on um, for structure. Um, uh, and, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, revivable, uh, a revival sustainable practice. Um, there's a, there's a, a group in Melbourne called Revival, a guy called Robbie Neville. If you haven't come across him, Google him. He's up to some awesome stuff. We had these timber trusses. It's a combination of Douglas fir and, um, and, and um, Oregon. And you know, they're from old growth forests in North America. They came out sometime in the 1800s, we think. And we, we just knew the material was incredible, but we didn't know what to do with it. We, we kind of connected with this guy, Robbie, who's batshit crazy. Robbie came in, we did a deal with the demo contractor. Robbie leased the warehouse next door. He took all of the timber next door, bought a thicknesser, and the rest is history. Robbie, for Design Week um, of that year, ran furniture making workshops for women, got, got um, some women on the tools. This is Claire Parry, who used to be with our team, who now heads up sustainability um, for Development Victoria. Um, and. Uh, two years later, Robbie set up this zero footprint repurposing um, uh, warehouse in Collingwood and uh, he won uh, the Design Week uh, prize for this space. And it's all about um, custodianship over materials. This space now is full of trees. So Robbie's got this program where any tree that gets cut down in the city comes into this space. Uh, he's, he's got a, a dehumidifier, he's drying the trees. Um, and, then, and then cutting them down and seeking to, to, to repurpose that, that material into higher value products. Um, the timber from Faraz and York has gone like so many places. We had this idea, there's this thing called Shark Tracker, which is like a, you know, you can, you can track all the, the, the great whites up, up the eastern seaboard in Australia. We wanted to kind of do that with the timber just to see over time where this timber would end up. We're still working on that idea, we've got to get that up. Um, but just the potential of using, thinking differently about your projects, our projects, and when you have these resources, putting in that little bit of extra effort um, to, to ensure that that value is carried forward. And the work that Robbie's done and, and our accidental connection is just such a great example of that potential. Um, electric vehicles, this building's fully provisioned for EV. It took six months to solve that problem without increasing supply to the building. We've, we've developed a demand management system with a company called Jet Charge in Australia. Um, highly recommend the guys. Uh, so essentially what that means is we can diversify within the load that we have within the building. Um, uh, so at 10 p.m. when everybody starts to go to bed and turn off TV, stop cooking, et cetera, et cetera, that base load to the building redirects to EVs in the morning when people start to wake up. Um, the, the building, the demand management system will redirect from the electric vehicles back to the building. So it's a really smart way of thinking about how we deal with the electrification of cities um, yeah, in, the, in the future. 
active transport, we prioritised bikes over cars. Um, we lost sales by doing that, but we kind of think it was a great, great filtering exercise. Um, so people, uh, people with car have to park uh, down the street a little bit, walk up the street, in through this gate, into the lobby. If you're on a bike, you can go straight into the lobby and up the lift, you get, you get priority. Um, and we put a little um, bike stand out on the street. That was meant to be in the bike room. Um, and we, had, we just had the idea through construction to do it. We didn't ask, council probably would have said no. Uh, and we haven't been fined yet. Um, bike gallery, this is just a story again. Like, when, when you view your responsibility as a developer seriously, you know, the easy fix for ground floor retail is to take the highest rent, um, get to the, the, the tightest yield, you can sell it for the most money. Um, the use doesn't necessarily line up with what community needs or wants or what the building wants, and there are plenty of examples around our cities where we see that play out. We'd, we'd rather take the longer term view. So Link um, bought an apartment in the building. He owns Bike Gallery. Uh, they had another store on the other side of town, and, and we were just out one night having a beer, and, and, and we came up with the idea of, of setting Bike Gallery up um, in, in the space and, and sharing the space. So. Um, we've got our south side studio, a little desk space in there. So it's about bikes, coffee, design, sustainability, and open work plan. Um, way too much bike talk. I have to work in Brunswick. Um, I don't get much work done in this space, but it's good fun. Um, health and wellbeing. Sustainability. We talk about energy and carbon so much. These buildings are healthier. Um, we installed energy recovery ventilation systems, air's cleaner, internal temperatures are more consistent um, with less active heating and cooling. Um, you know, for the, for the young and the elderly, uh, that means significantly better health outcomes. That means the flu, um, you, you know, you, you, the overnight temperatures aren't dropping to 10 degrees inside your home, which I heard a stat the other day, the average rental in Melbourne, the overnight temperature is 10 degrees um, through winter. It's, and it's no wonder people are getting sick and, and clogging up hospitals. Acoustic performance. We can build these buildings in really dense um, inner city locations. This project's next to light rail and two busy roads. We can build quality homes um, that live really, really well because the external envelope doors and windows are of a high quality and they're sealed properly. Um, to hammer that point home, we kept a two bedroom apartment in this project and it's up, up for a short stay. And that's again about getting as many people through to experience better and what better feels like and looks like as possible. Um, we're, we're so limited in what we do, we can only ever deliver a small number of apartments at any given time, but having HV Hotel up for rent it just enables us to get more and more people um, uh, experiencing space. When I take people through tours of this project, purposefully take them into HV Hotel, get everyone to be quiet inside, and then we'll shut the door and it's like a light bulb going off. It kind of blows people's minds. I love to take conservative-minded people in who just don't give a shit about sustainability. Take them in, close the front door, and watch the reaction. It, it works. It really works. It's like, oh, wow, this is good. It's like, yep, yeah, it's good. Seeing's believing, it's powerful. Post-op monitoring, our better buildings team, it's all about the detail. So we ran 12 months post-op, it's an AWARE sensor, it gives us um, IEQ um, data on temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, volatile organic compounds, dust, light, noise, and we build up that data set, we correlate it against energy performance, so we start to build a profile of how the buildings are performing, and we test that back against modelled assumptions. Um, here's a nice image. This is uh, the filter six months in um, from the energy recovery ventilation system. So that's a whole bunch of dust and grit that's not in your home and in your lungs, um, the power of energy recovery ventilation. Um, test results that we got out of 12 months of data analysis, heating and cooling bills down 20%, um, domestic hot water down 21%, cooking bills 32%, um, pretty significant savings. Um, one other lesson we took from the post-occupancy uh, research is around the importance of commissioning properly. This is the heat pump system 
installed in the building. These are the buffer tanks. There's four buffer tanks for, for the heat pump hot water. Um, about three months in, we had some data sort of suggesting that, that energy consumption was about, in aggregate, about 35 to 40% higher than it should have been. Um, and we set about finding out why, got, got all of the different um, you know, players in a room, the builder, services, engineer, um, the supplier, everybody with their hands in their pockets, nobody wanting to own up to, to a potential issue. Um, and we identified that a, a, a really simple fix um, there was a ring main, a hot, hot water ring main, and an inline electric heat pump to keep that ring main water temperature above 60 degrees, um, heat pump temperature at 60 degrees. Uh, at commissioning, it, it had been left at factory setting of 75 degrees, so that thing hadn't turned off from the day it had been switched on, uh, and it had cost the building about $10,000. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to pin it on anyone yet, but it just talks to the importance of of, of commissioning properly, like how many buildings out there that exist in this space, in this mid-scale space, have systems that are chewing more energy than they need to? How do we commission more properly? It's one of the benefits of postdoc research, really, really testing our assumptions and seeing whether or not our buildings are working the way we thought they would, and being willing to share that information. For a business like us, it's 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 full disclosure. That's why we exist. Um, the other cool thing that happened was we had um, Stiebel had some German engineers in town and they looked at this, this um, pipe setup. and one of the guys is a classic, is this not how we do it in Germany? Um, and there was a bleed valve missing, so the tanks weren't mixing uh, the way that they were meant to, so the first tank was filling up with hot water and, and then spilling over, not mixing kind of more differentially across the four tanks. Um, so Stiebel off their own bat came in and installed um, those bleed valves where they should be. Um, and we then got better mixing, more efficient. Um, uh, the system was working more efficiently and we got another 5% bump in efficiency and we could track that through the data. It's me and the family. So the future for us is low carbon timber. This is a, I was on a recent study tour in Sweden. This is a fully automated um, CLT production facility in Sweden, closed loop, um, the offcuts are burnt, the energy, um, the emissions are captured, the energy powers the plant and heats water to uh, provide hot water to 60,000 homes in the region. 100% um, closed loop, they're so far ahead, it's not funny. Um, low carbon timber, passive house, we're doubling down on passive house. The reason we like passive house is it's one of the very few certification pathways that provide a performance guarantee. And for me, with my developer hat on, whenever you're asking someone to spend more money in the commercial world, you have to be able to justify it. So if a certification pathway can, can provide a guarantee that a building will use a certain amount of energy by virtue of all the post-occupancy testing requirements that are inherent to passive house, then that's a certification pathway that can gain support from financially minded people. Um, this is Gillies Hall by Jackson Clements Burroughs Architects, Monash University student housing project. If you ever get a chance to check it out, it's, it's a seriously impressive building built, built out of CLT to passive house standard. It's me on the right taking photos of details when I should be listening. So, yeah. um, and our next project, Austin Maynard Architects, um, collaborating with HVH. So Austin Maynard have done the most successful projects in the Nightingale Village um, park life. And together, um, we're actually currently designing up our next building. I don't, we don't have any visuals to show you um, just yet. Um, but that's, we're just really excited by that collaboration. There's just a deep commitment between the two businesses to push harder um, and to seek to deliver the kinds of buildings that can set an exemplar for um, what our future cities uh, can be and should be. And just to close out shot, apartments for people and planet. And um, this is the roof yard looking back towards the city. Um, we do have a fireplace up on the roof that is sustainably sourced timber from series, um, but sometimes a little bit of carbon for, for a bit of humanity perhaps isn't such a bad thing. So tomorrow is definitely too late. Start, start today. And what's it going to be?
Thanks very much.